we just have to be very careful about not saying, well, you know what, if we do say it, we can always, you yeah. know, always bleep it out. True. I think we should avoid saying or. Oh, absolutely. All right. Hey, Matthew. Oh, hey. Didn't see you there. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take two. <laughs> take two. Well, take, take two for season two, right? I was going to say, welcome to season two. Welcome. Welcome to season two. I see what you did there. <laughs> All right, take three. Take three. <laughs> no, no, no. No, take three. You have to wait for season three. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's a wrap on season two, everybody. <laughs> Good season, everyone. Good season. Good game. Good game. <laughs> Oh, terrible. Well, we are back. It is season two. Welcome back, everybody. Yep, it's great to be back and to have all of our viewer watching us. <laughs> all of all of our viewer. Hello, viewer. Hello. Uh, I mean, we assume that's how the internet works, that only one person can view this at a time. Right. Um, it's not omni-channel, they call that? One right, one. omni. Yeah, it's every everywhere but just one. So we are we are on season two, as you saw with our awesome new intro. I was, by the way, that was impressive. Thank I you. Was, Thank you. I knew it was going to be better than last season. I did not expect it to be that much better. But I have to step it up, you know. To be fair, I haven't made it yet. But <laughs> <laughs> but I know when you finish it. Future, future me is going to do a fantastic job. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be great. Yeah. It's going to be great. Kudos to you. Thanks. If I were wearing a hat, I, I would take it off. But, you know, we can't do it all alone. And sometimes we have to uh, collaborate on things like we're collaborating right. on the show. But uh, right. just go with my segue. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I told you not to use that word. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Yes, we, we do yeah, often we work together, not just on uh, YouTube channels. That's right. We oh, also do okay. it uh, for things we get paid for. Right. And we and we finished one recently, a big one. Right. We and it was it. interesting because the work we were doing, we don't. It's work that's not typically done remotely. Right. One. Right. A lot of times, it's it's work that's done in, in the same uh, co location. So that alone presented some interesting challenges. But beyond that, it was just a really interesting large project. And I think it'd be great to kind of talk through it, explain how we attacked it and whether or not it was successful. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, we should start with some some uh, some background for this so people understand what we're talking about. Yeah, what what was the project about? So we we did we were brought on, we did some work through another agency. We were brought on to uh, I think the the initial ask was to produce a journey map and did that with some flavoring of a service blueprint as well. Um, and if I may just clarify, a current state journey map. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, that was a very specific part of the project. Yeah, and of course, the one of the fun parts of that was they were doing a lot of reorganization, a lot of, a lot of upcoming changes. So mapping out the current state while they were going through all these changes was challenging to talk about because it was, well, when this comes in, in a couple months, so for them, the current state was also future state. And as is typical with our, with our work, there are NDAs involved, and we're going to talk around those. And we were specific. Not, not even to be coy about that. It's just, you know, we can't talk about that. You, oh, you, yeah. You know. We yeah, respect the NDA. Absolutely. And the piece of the organization, it's a huge, huge organization with hundreds of employees, <laughs> many thousands of employees. <laughs> And the specific slice of the organization was in their their telephone support, not just telephone, but other channels as well. Yeah, and not even their global support, but a very thin slice of even their support organization. Right. right. So to just give you an idea of, of of scope and how we're trying to whittle it down to a manageable research activity. This is a huge, huge, huge organization, and they asked us to look at a very, very narrow slice of it and evaluate. Yeah, their current state, because part of the, 
the, the reasoning for the project from the client's perspective is they are so big, they don't even know all their current processes. Right. And that was kind of how this, this evolved. It started out being a fairly a, a larger project and was de-scoped considerably. But in the end, the problem was they don't even know what they're doing themselves. They don't have it documented across the organization. They don't have a clear vision about what other pieces of that journey look like. And they wanted an outside company to come in and understand it for them <laughs> and explain it to them. Yeah. Like, here's what you're doing. Yeah, I think in the in the interviews, it became clear that everyone really understood their piece. But then, you know, to your point, how do all those pieces then fit together was the, the charge of why we were there. We only had a few weeks to complete the project. So taking on the entire customer support, you know, that there was just no way we we're going to be able to do all of that in just a couple of weeks. As it was the narrow slice we took, we barely got done in the time that we had allotted. Right, because we could have done a lot more. And I think in a lot of ways, we ended up doing a lot more than the scope necessarily called for, but it was the right work to do. And I will get to that, but. Yeah, there are definitely some additional opportunities that we uncovered beyond the scope that we were allotted that we would love to go back in and do more. In. Yeah, it's probably good to talk about some of the constraints that we were working with is one was just a time crunch. Uh, two, uh, we were doing this all remotely. Not just you and I being remotely, but the client was remote. Our intermediary client was also <laughs> based in another state. And then the research was happening all remote as well. Right. Yeah. We had calls with people on mountain time and India time. So people were, were all over the place. So that was, I won't say like a challenge challenge, but certainly a, a constraint that we had to deal with. So constraints obviously right. the uh and we were going to interview 19 people and and the goal was to get that that view across the organization within that slice that we had defined and we were looking for that current state but that extra ask was also you know what are where are places we can find efficiency where we can find opportunities to automate the organization itself is going through some changes with software with process. So as researchers, that presented a challenge to for us to keep in mind, all right, what's current state? What's near-term future state? And as we talk to people, make sure we're understanding which state they're talking to, because <laughs> some have already been exposed to the new future. Right. Stuff happened. Yeah, my, and my, so, my favorite ask was, don't make it pretty. <laughs> right, right. Like whatever you deliver us, don't make it look too good, which in a lot of ways I felt like really showed a level of maturity from the people who were the stake, primary stakeholders of the project. You know, having that understanding where we want to map out something that we know is going to change. And if it's too pretty, it's going to become too precious and you're going to put too much work into it and just make it something that's understandable and readable and to their credit also it, it reduced the cost because we would have yeah likely had a higher a third person focused on the visuals so the process itself of doing the interviews yep we talked about the the time zone tracking which was not overly challenging but a little bit challenging um, especially getting up at 4 a.m for <laughs> an, an interview and trying to be on well, um, and the fact that we were all in multiple time zones, you, me, the stakeholders, right, right, yeah. keeping us all in the same in sync with the time zone. And fortunately, we had a tool that we we're using Airtable to track our interviews in. And Airtable did a good job of localizing the time zone to whoever was looking at it. And not, not a sponsor. <laughs> not a sponsor at all. So, you know, call me. It ended up being a really great tool to keep track of who we were talking to, when we were talking to them. Uh, the stages at which we had talked to them, uploading all the artifacts. And we even used it to keep track of which one of us was going to be leading the interviews mm -hmm. because we, we both tried to be on as many as we could. But again, because of the time zones, because of other factors, sometimes just one of us was on those calls. And right. so we identified for each call who would be the lead interviewer. That was in their table as well to keep us organized mm -hmm. as we went through this. Because we did these 19 interviews over the course of... 10 business days, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. What I think is maybe a little not as typical, but what I felt really worked 
was our point of contact for the client, they had access to the Airtable as well. So we were relying on them to help us with the scheduling and to help us figure out who we should be talking to because they know their people. So we were all in that Airtable and it was something that was that was client facing. I think that was really helpful. So they knew what was going on the whole time as well. It provided transparency as well as collaboration. Right. Uh, to what we're going on. So at any point they could see who had been interviewed, you know, when that interview, did that interview take place? Did it have to be rescheduled? Like all that stuff was happening in Airtable and they were part of it, which helped a lot to make it easier for us to communicate. We didn't have to communicate as often, right? Because he knew right. <laughs> he could see what was going on. Right. And we had weekly check-ins, but those weekly check-ins, they didn't, we did them. Right. But they didn't last very long. They were very brief. <laughs> they were very brief. And, you know, we'll get to that in a bit, but that's kind of why we want to talk about this. Is this is a very highly collaborative project, and uh, it led to a little disappointment in my heart. At that <laughs> but we'll get to that. So one of the things that we really relied on with these interviews is we obviously recorded all of our conversations that we had with the people we were interviewing. And then we used the, uh, since we're talking tools a bit, uh, we used rev.com to get transcripts of every conversation. Yeah, not, not a plug, but again, by any stretch, but it was a great tool to use because not just the accuracy, but also speed and cost. The interviews were about an hour each. I can't remember. I think they were 60 minutes each. Yeah, I think they ranged from like 45 to an hour and 15 in that range, so... And they were able to turn around the transcripts in sometimes 12 hours or less, mm -hmm. which kept us moving again because we were on this very tight timeline and we did not want to go back and listen to the recordings ourselves. If only one of us could have been on the call, the other person obviously had no way of knowing what happened. Right. And it's a lot quicker to just breeze through the transcript than to listen to the recording. So those became a critical tool yeah. uh, as we analyzed the interviews. Worth, worth the money. Absolutely worth the money. I mean, I don't want to say only, but it was only a dollar a minute to get the transcripts done. And I think we ended up seven, I think it was $709 was the expense for all the transcripts. And totally worth it. Totally worth it. It's <laughs> not even, not even a question. Yeah. It saved us hours reading interviews and note taking. And, you know, and again, when you're, when you're talking about pulling out quotes, like the transcripts, it's there, you just copy paste it into whatever you know, quote repository you're looking at. You don't have to actually sit there and mm -hmm. type it, rewind it, type it, to make sure you're getting it correct. Right. Which we used Airtable for as well. That's right. So Airtable was not just our interview uh, repository, but also our data collection repository. Right. There were, there were a couple of reasons why we chose that over something like Excel or, or Google Sheets. I'm pretty sure that stuff that we did in Airtable, we could have done in Google Sheets, but it would take, have taken more work. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Airtable is a, a web-based product, so we were able to collaborate real-time, mm -hmm. which Google Sheets could have done or could do. But yeah, there was a, uh, a certain level of complexity to what we were doing that Sheets might have been able to support, but we didn't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and Airtable made it pretty easy to just take care of it. Where we went beyond what we needed to do is how many passes of the data that we did so in a way, the first pass was the interview itself. The second pass was we would pull up the transcript of each interview together and live and, and go through. And then, but we'd get on a call like we're doing right now, and we would take out the things that we thought were interesting or, or salient uh, commentary on the process that we were trying to map. And we would put that in the air table and we would go through and, and, you know, do the first participants transcript and we'd get done. And then we'd go through that again together, this time a little more conversational and pulling out the duplicates saying, is this really important? Is this more important than this? Tidying up that, that first pass on the raw data. And each one of those nuggets was tied to the person that said it, the category of what it, you know, we, we, we organically created a list of categories for all of these things. And so each one was then tagged to those categories as well. Right. Yeah. Once we had gone through all the transcripts, we, we categorized things and let, let the data tell us what the category should be. 
So we, so we ended up with we didn't have any sense of like what things should be. How many data points did we end up with? A hundred eighty six. Oh yeah, it did get up to close to one eighty. It was like one seventy nine. I think we were just shy of one eighty or something like that. But so one eighty, and then we had seven categories. Uh, I forget seven or eight categories. Seven or eight categories. Yeah. Yeah. So you can kind of get a sense for the the numbers that we're talking about. Not thousands, but definitely enough that going mm -hmm. through one hundred eighty items seven times was not a quick or easy. Right, because then we had to go through and and summarize that because all the summaries would then be used as data points on the map and all the items on the list, I don't think any of them were only one category of a thing. Right. Except for maybe the like the quotes where we just wanted to pull some what someone said as as a quote and put it on the deliverable. It's just being a picture of the data flow. We went from the interviews into the Airtable sheet or whatever you want to call it, the table. And then each of those 180 data points then went into the journey map and were plotted to moments along the journey right. that emerged. And so each one of those data points was somewhere on those journey, on that journey map. And we ended up making two journey maps from different perspectives of the different um, users. So we talked to agents, so we did a journey map from their perspective and a journey map from the customer's perspective, just to show the balance, even though we didn't get to talk to customers, which was right. another issue. We, we, we gathered the data that we heard from the people that we talked with who were internal about their perspective on the customer. Again, this has to do with like the scope and the timing of the project. Right. Um, not that they, they knew that talking to customers is the logical and appropriate next step. It's just for this project, we just talked with internal. But we felt like we were already hearing things, even though they didn't ask for that perspective, we felt it was our job, our duty to at least detailed and documented out. So we ended up making an extra journey map in a way. <laughs> uh, just we felt it was right and we had the data, so why not? You know, the other thing that we talked about while we were building these these deliverables, because we were gonna turn over the, the air table as well, is the idea that these documents get shared internally after the project is over. We want that person, if they only ever see the map, but don't see the air table, that there's traceability between the two. So I would say for the most part, you could just look at the map and understand what the journey is, what the pain points are, and how those pain, uh, what categories do those pain points hit? But if someone just looked at the air table, they could get the, the same sense, maybe not the, the nice visual aspect to it, obviously, but, but all the data, you know, is traceable between the two documents. And I think that that's, that's, again, something where we went a bit beyond what we needed to do because we knew that working with such a large organization, you need documents to be able to stand on their own as much as possible. And I feel like that falls into the category of the client wouldn't have even known to ask for that because they just wanted a journey map. They didn't even know or expect to get the air table, like the actual raw data. Right. Um, but the fact that we we're delivering it, we saw the the need or the future need to be able to tie those together. Because again, the journey map had summaries, the air table had the summaries plus the actual data from the transcripts. So yeah. as you said, they could always back into it. And the one thing we ended up taking out of the air table were the interviewees who said, who gave us the data because we wanted to protect their anonymity. So we actually ended up stripping out that attribute. Which is, a, which is a promise that we make to all of our participants, whether they're internal employees or they're external customers, is we're not going to name you. We won't so name names. We've seen in the past when where people want to reach out to the customer and explain to them what what they really should have been doing. And that's not how this is supposed to work. So Right, right. So after we got the journey map done in a good place, at least from our perspective, we had another ask from the client and that was to do some collaborative workshops with the folks that we interviewed. Well, initially it was just, just the workshop. Right. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please continue. Please continue. <laughs> oh no. Well, so originally we, they asked us to do a workshop at a, a neutral territory at a location <laughs> <laughs> within the U S that everyone was going to travel to. And we're going to do an on-site two day workshop. I believe that Matthew and I would facilitate. And as we got closer and closer to the day, so we had a date a week that we had to identified 
in the schedule to do this based on other external factors. And as we got closer and closer to that date, the client decided due to cost, due to scheduling, that just wasn't feasible to get everyone into one room right. at the same time. So we agreed that we would do them remotely. So it was going to be about 20 people, you know, all the interviewees. <laughs> I will say, I will say when they're like, well, we could do it remotely. And, and immediately I was, my first thought was, oh, I don't know how we're going to do 20 people <laughs> on a call like this right? and have it be valuable and meaningful <laughs> and keep right. their attention. Right. For two days. Right. Right. <laughs> So we, we, we didn't we, do that. <laughs> we did not do that. We, we thought about it ourselves and said, how can we make this an, a useful exercise? And we, we changed the focus a bit. And I think it, it turned out really well. We, so instead of being a kind of collaborative workshop where we're going to do lots of activities of sketching and ideation, we flipped it a little bit. So it became more of a review of what we had learned. So we basically focused on the journey map and we walked everyone through. So let me back up a little bit. So we, we broke it up instead of 20 people in one workshop, we took the 20 people and broke it up into five small workshops with four people each. And we focused on the journey map by taking the groups through what we had done, help us identify gaps, things we might've misheard, things we didn't even know what to ask for during our initial interviews. Basically correct us. We kind of set that expectation of, we know this is not 100% right. We're looking for you to help us flesh this out more and improve it. All in all, it went really well. Engagement was really high. People got excited about it. They felt like they were part of the process. It didn't turn into a presentation where we were just you know, reading things to people, though there was a presentation portion of the, of the workshop, but it kept them involved and engaged and it helped us understand the data a little bit more and, and like I said, identify some gaps and fill in some spaces that we didn't know what else to put in. One of the things that surprised me a little bit, but shouldn't have looking back on it is as we went further along and did more workshops, you know, we got to the fourth workshop and the fifth workshop, there wasn't as much feedback because the first three workshops found a lot of the places where we had the gaps where we had, you know, oh, it, these two things are, this comes before this, not after where they, they'd fixed a lot of that. So it was really more more validating, not that they didn't contribute and help us make it better. If we had done one event with 20 people all online, probably 15 of them wouldn't have said anything or would have said very little because that's just how group communication works. And then you would have had a few people driving the conversation. And I don't think that we would have gotten as refined as we did by taking the... You gotta be kidding me. Always mute your phone. <laughs> no, that was that came through my computer. Oh, it was your computer? I can tell. <laughs> anyway, talking about but, that collaborative approach, iterative approach, um, I think got us to a more refined, more accurate map than if we had done one workshop with 20 people. Because we had, I think one of the workshops only had one or two people or like one person for a portion of it because people had to come and go. So, you know, those people were, were participating. <laughs> right, right, yeah. You know, whether they wanted to or not, we, uh, mm -hmm. we had them on, on the, in the spotlight. Yeah, and I agree. And it, it helped us gain our confidence over the week. And it was validating once we got to the end of the week. And we weren't getting as much feedback. It's like, okay, we, we must have this pretty buttoned up. People aren't, have, don't have much to add to it. Yeah, and then the other ask, of course, that we were having of everybody during these workshops is how can we make this more efficient? So, again, you know, we're trying to be current state, but as you're there, if you, you know, you see something that can be improved, why not talk about it? And so that's one of the things that we did in all of these workshops is we co-created, you know, principles that their internal team could then use to determine when they're looking at this. If we're looking for areas of efficiency or automation, what principles should we follow to determine if it should be automated? and if it should be automated, to what extent and how. So we had, we still had more classic workshop things for participants to do. So it wasn't solely just, you know, react to this map that we have up on the screen here and let's move some boxes around. But people were, were contributing to the content that would ultimately be delivered. Jumping forward to the final readout that we did and why there was sort of a little disappointment 
at the end right. of it for me because all those people what did we have on the the final call 25 people right we had some additional people on the final readout all the participants plus another five or six right. people plus some other yeah, stakeholders and you know we we walk through everything we did sort of what we're doing on this on the show right now but but with a slide deck <laughs> and less Google phone calls interrupting what you're doing. And a little more detail, but yes. A little more detail, obviously. But we got to the end and and there were really essentially no questions. No yeah. no gasps. <laughs> no ahas, <laughs> no, ah no, no ah ahas. Like, hey. and, and yeah, it's a, that's a result of being super collaborative because everyone was part of the process. When we did our first workshops, we heard, I think, more surprises of like, oh, this is really interesting or this is really cool. And, and yeah, the... the the sparkle was off or whatever the phrase is. By the time we got to that last one, everyone had seen, except for those five or so people, everyone had seen what we were presenting. And helped to make it. And helped make it. They were part of it. Um, so there was no uh, no accolades, no pats on the back. <laughs> there were pats and they, they did appreciate the work. Yeah. Oh, for sure. it, was, it was fairly uh, anticlimactic. Right, right. And And that's how it should be. Mm -hmm. But there's still a little part of me was like, oh, no one cheered. <laughs> right. Well, we, when we entered that final call, it was like, felt a little, uh, a little awkward. <laughs> Is that it? Are we done? <laughs> right. Right. Like, no more questions? You guys got it? Okay. Yeah. See you later. But that is but they did send us a very no, nice note. Good. Yeah. They did send us a nice note. Yeah. Appreciative of all the work that we did. Yeah. So it was a, it was a final kind of ending with a thud, but not because it wasn't good work, but because there were just no surprises to it. Right. Yeah. All, I would say almost we could have not done the final readout and just hand it. it was totally better that we did it that way because I think it did a final contextualizing for everybody as a group of what we were handing over to them. But yeah, it was uh, anticlimactic <laughs> again, which is good. <laughs> right. And overall, a really good and satisfying project for us because of, you know, we got, I was obviously working together is always fun for the right. two of us, but the project itself went relatively smooth, very smoothly with, you know, a few road bumps along the way, but client was very happy. We were very happy. Our intermediary contact was was very happy everyone was very happy very very happy all around and it was a different type of project not so much for matthew and i because we do work together like this often but for the clients mm -hmm. they don't typically work this way yeah so i think for them it was a bit of a proving ground because they all like to work in person um to show that this type of work can be done remotely and collaboratively and successfully mm -hmm. that to me was as much of a win as the actual data portion of it was showing that the process can, can work one of the asks from our the agency that brought us in to do the work was you know do as much as you can to teach along the way the client because they may want to pick up some of this work and do it themselves and we want to give them good habits that was part of the reason that we were being so highly collaborative is that you know, not only were we doing the work with the people, but we were also talking with them about our approach and why we're choosing these things. Our primary contact at the client has access to this Airtable, and, you know, we walk them through how we put this together and, and why it's this way. And now they have, um, you know, a little insight into to how, the, how to potentially do the work on their own. Exactly. Or bring us back. We miss you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So good project. Yeah. And I just, I'm, I don't know. I, I tend to not get overly excited about these things, but I'm very pleased with the way we decided to do the project. Part of it was, you know, we had the constraints that we talked about at the beginning of the show, but within those constraints, I think we delivered something that was really going to be helpful to them and something of value. And that, again, it goes back to that. We didn't want to do a workshop with 20 people because there wouldn't be a value out of it as much as splitting it up into five workshops with four people each. High five. High five. Good job. <laughs> See you next time. And don't forget to subscribe. Right. Don't forget to subscribe <laughs> and share and like, and That's please, right. please validate us.